Hello, hello, Katie Kimball for the Healthy Parenting Connector here, and I have been immersed in families struggling with picky eating for the last couple days. Last Friday, we opened up our Facebook group for the live, free, no more picky eating challenge, and I've just been interacting with very worried, very concerned moms and dads all weekend about the struggles they're having with their kids, and we've been talking about whether or not we were picky eaters as kids and what sort of preferences and aversions we had. What I love the most is the hope that that brings, that we can look back and say, wow, I didn't eat A, B, C, X, Y, and Z. I hated these textures, but yet now my tastes have changed. Okay, so that is encouragement number one, is that when your kids are struggling with eating, there is hope, there is growth, their taste buds, their palate, their interaction with food can and will change especially if we set up the right routines, environments, and habits in our home, especially if we give them the opportunity to grow, if we use growth language and develop a growth mindset. So today I'm keeping this really short. I just have three little shifts that I want to recommend for you. I think, I think we get into that day-to-day, -day, we get into that day-to-day -day of making the meals and the breakfast and lunch and the dinner and the homework and the driving and the bedtime routines and the baths and, and sometimes we just barrel through and we're not really pulling back and observing and thinking. And so today I am your pattern interrupt. I'm going to give you either a challenge, an encouragement, or just a little piece of knowledge, something that can like shift your perspective that maybe you didn't understand before about how your child might think or how they might be interacting with food that can radically change the way you relate to them at the table, which in turn can radically change the way they relate to food because it's all about connection. Number one, it has to be said, we've got to talk about screens at the table. I'm actually encouraged because this is the third time I've run the No More Picky Eating Challenge. The first time was April 2021. And well, and before that, for many years, I had done uh, webinars, I had done master classes on picky eating. And one of my my biggest surprises in beginning to interact with parents, and this is again, particularly before 2020 or 2021, is the number of parents who said, uh, my kid watches a screen at the table, or they literally won't eat unless they're watching a screen and I'm spoon feeding them. Lots and lots and lots of kids on individual screens or families on screens together or families all on individual screens. Uh, to me, this, was surprising only because that's not currently my experience. Ironically, I actually did grow up at a home where we watched TV every night during the meal. So I don't know why it was so surprising to me, but I think it was just that idea of like the personal devices. So here's the deal. If your kids particularly or your family watches screens during family meals, here is what you are missing out on. Here is what the screens are kicking out and replacing. Number one, a sense of mindfulness about your eating. Okay, when you're doing something else, especially when you're watching a screen, there is, um, sorry, I think my, just making sure something popped up. I wanna make sure my video is doing the right thing. I think so, okay. When you're, when you're watching that screen, when the stimulation is coming from the screen into your eyeballs and into your ears, you are very much not paying attention to what you're eating. We can create a habit of unmindfulness, a habit of mindless eating. And unfortunately, what that habit creates when we come to adults is likely overeating, eating too much, sometimes gravitating toward those comfort foods because they're easier to eat. And I, I'm, guys, that's the last thing we want to do. That's the last thing we want to do. Okay, obesity in kids has like tripled since the 80s. So Maybe our parents didn't raise us perfectly when it came to a relationship with food. However, <laughs> I don't think we've fixed the problem yet. We absolutely don't want to encourage mindless eating. That is a short-term solution to get food into bellies. It is not a long-term solution to set up habits for good nourishment and, and good independence and adult behavior for life. So, so first, screens are kicking out the idea of mindful eating, of chewing well and of paying attention to our foods and of, you know, interacting and enjoying the sights and smells and sounds of the table. Screens are also kicking out conversation. 
There is so much research, an incredible body of research on the immense benefits of family dinners. Everything from reducing your teenager's risk of depression, suicide, and substance abuse, to increasing your elementary preschool child's vocabulary, to increasing our kids' academic success. The family dinner makes more of an impact on grades than time spent on homework and time spent in school. That is research-based. However, it's the conversation mostly, in part and in most, it's the conversation at the family dinner that helps those little kids build their vocabulary, that connects the adolescents to their parents and forms those bonds that are the protective factor against depression and suicidal thoughts and abuse, drug abuse tendencies. If we are kicking out the conversation by inviting screens to the table, we do our kids a great deep disservice. It's very sad. So we need mindful eating. We need a relationship with other humans at the table and we need a relationship with our food. Screens, sabotage, all of that. If you happen to have slid into a bad habit of screens, and again, this is daily, like, come on, guys in the Kimball family, we watch Lego Masters or we watch the Olympics or we watch, you know, a show here and there, maybe once or twice a week. But we prioritize family conversation and we eat six to seven dinners together per week, plus some lunches and breakfasts on the weekends. If you've got a daily habit of screens, it doesn't have to last forever. Kids are adaptable, they're flexible, there may be some, I mean, there's gonna be some friction, there may be some tears as you shift this routine, but I guarantee you can shift it, and I guarantee that for the long term, for the long game of parenting, of raising healthy, independent, competent, and well-nourished adults, ditching the screens at the table is 100% the right thing to do. So that is my challenge to you. Second topic that I want to talk about is, is a perspective shift, okay? This, uh, this is something that is new, a little bit new to me too. I learned this just when I was trained in the SOS Approach to Feeding by Dr. Kay Toomey and her associates. She's amazing. She's the foremost picky eating expert in North America, perhaps in the world. And, and when I went through this really intensive SOS Approach to Feeding training, Dr. Toomey explained that kids see food differently. They, they process the idea of eating so differently than adults because we are shackled by our intellect. We're shackled by the information that we've learned throughout our years of schooling, right? So when we look at a food, our brains immediately put them into a category. Maybe it's the macros, protein, fats, and starches. Maybe it's food groups on you know the old food pyramid, the grains, the fruits, the vegetables, the meats, the fats, whatever, right? We, we put them in these categories based on human constructs and what we've learned in our intellect. Kids think differently. When kids see or taste a food, they judge it, they categorize it based on how it looks, how it feels in their mouth, and how it tastes. And that's it. They don't care what labels are on it, right? Kids judge their food based on how it looks, how it feels in their mouth, and how it tastes. And what that means is that chicken isn't always chicken. And, and actually, uh, my husband listened to me practice my picky eating TEDx talk, and at the end, he, he sat back and he said, huh, that's why Gabe doesn't always like chicken. Gabe is our seven-year-old, and um, especially when he was a little younger, at five and six, he, he would really have trouble, and he still doesn't really like a grilled chicken or grilled steak um, or these meats that are, it's called real meats, that are a little bit harder to chew. But he loves our slow cooker barbecue chicken, our instant pot barbecue chicken, our shredded you know, beef roast barbecue beef. And so my husband would... He caught himself after listening to my pick eating TEDx, my husband caught himself and he said, Oh my goodness, I've been saying exactly the wrong thing. Cause I'll say things like, Gabe, buddy, you like chicken, eat the chicken. You, you like chicken. What are you doing, man? And, and what we should be saying is, well, this is chicken. And the other day you like chicken, but I understand that they feel different, right? To Gabe as a five, six and seven year old, that slow cooker falling apart shredded chicken is a completely different food. It's a completely different experience to him 
than what we put in our intellect in the same category with the grilled chicken, right? Uh, we know it's literally the same food, but to a kid, two different foods. I want you to remember this when you're interacting with your children about what they are choosing to eat and choosing not to eat. Because when we say, it's a cracker, you like crackers, just eat the cracker, bud, right? Or it's an apple, you've always liked apples, you just had an apple yesterday. What we don't understand is that we are speaking a different food language than our kids, right? A square orange cracker is very different than a circular brown cracker, even though to us, they're the same. A cracker that pops apart in your mouth is a different food than a cracker that's like really dense and crispy and sort of crumbles in the mouth. A cracker that melts in the mouth is different than a cracker that is, you know, like a tortilla chip that crumbles in the mouth. These are different to kids. The apple the child ate yesterday might have been, you know, a green, crisp Granny Smith, and the apple you're offering today might be a red gala. Or like for me, I love apples, but don't try to give me a red delicious apple bought in a grocery store because they're mealy to me. The texture's totally off. I'm sure if you start thinking about your own preferences and likes and dislikes, you might be able to realize that you too like and dislike the same food served in different ways. And what I want you to remember is that to a child, that is a completely different food. It's a completely different experience. And I want us to lead with empathy. I want us to lead with this new sense of understanding in our language and in how we interact with kids and in what we expect of them and what we ask them to do. We don't need them to eat the same thing today just because they liked it last week or eat the quotes same thing tomorrow just because they ate something we think is similar today. Cool, right? Shift your perspective, shift your understanding, lead with empathy, and adjust your language. The last little tidbit I want to talk to you about today is the importance of how we start the meal. I know I've talked about this before, but honestly, guys, I fall out of this habit all the time because we're rushing around, we're finishing dinner, we're like, oh, let's say grace, and we say our prayer, and two or three of us are standing in the kitchen, and some of us are sitting, and we're still serving, and uh, and then we all kind of eat and half the people are done before I even sit down. Ah, so I'm doing this for myself. I'm going to say, Katie, that is not ideal. That is not ideal both for family conversation and all those massive benefits of family dinner, but it's also not ideal for digestion and for kids building a good relationship with food. We know that the autonomic nervous system has two sides, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. And when we're in the sympathetic nervous system, that's the fight or flight, that's the rush around, right? It's the stress response. And it's not always a bad thing. We, we need that stress response to get things done. But we also need the parasympathetic state to be oscillating and to be kicking in often, and particularly before a meal, we really want to help our kids and help ourselves get into that parasympathetic nervous system state. That is the rest and digest. If we're eating a meal in fight or flight or freeze in, a, in having a stress response, we're actually not digesting like half the food. And I know I've shared this before, but I, I, I again, this is for me. This is for Katie today because I've been terrible at this lately as we've been rushing around. You can almost picture whatever your kids eat or you eat, half of the meal just being thrown away because it's just shooting through. It's not being digested well. Your body's not using those nutrients. So what are we doing? It only takes a few seconds to a minute or two to get that parasympathetic state kicked in. So here are a few ways you can do it. First, you can do a 2x breath. So that's like a breathe in three and a breathe out six. Or if you have really good breath control, a breathe in four and a breathe out eight. Just do three to five of those breaths together as a family, seated, <laughs> and that will kick your body into the parasympathetic state. There are other ways. There are some oils, um, particularly, and I should leave, I should leave the link uh, wherever we share this video. Vibrant Blue Oils has a parasympathetic oil, and you can apply that particularly to that bone, and touch that right now, that bone behind your ear that's called the mastoid bone. You can apply oils to that mastoid bone for a less expensive, non-product-based way to initiate the parasympathetic state with that mastoid bone, 
uh, which is the right spot, by the way, because that's where your vagus nerve runs. Your vagus nerve runs from your brain down to your gut, kind of around your throat, and and it goes around that mastoid bone, particular, particularly I'm thinking the right side. You can just teach your kids to tap on that bone a little bit or do a little tiny rub, like a circular massage rub gently on that bone, and that's going to initiate the vagus nerve. It's going to connect your brain with your gut and help you digest food better. Laughter is a great way to get into the parasympathetic, the anti-stressed state. How can we laugh more as a family around the dinner table, particularly at the beginning of dinner? This is not always easy, but if you're thinking about it, if you're intentional, maybe you can get your family laughing. Try to collect a story each day that you can tell or ask your kids to share some funny stories. And quite honestly, just slowing down. Slowing down our speech, slowing down our physical bodies, slowing down our chewing, which has more benefits than just the parasympathetic state. The more we chew, the better our digestion is going to be. So those are my challenges for you. If you happen to be in a screen habit, those screens are pushing out and displacing and replacing very huge benefits that we want at the family dinner table. I encourage you to push those screens back out of your mealtime life. Number two, I want you to shift your thinking. I want you to understand that kids see food differently. And please lead with empathy and shift your language to accepting the fact that, that kids are processing those different preparations of foods, different visuals in different ways. And finally, I do encourage you to start those meals. And again, encouraging myself, come on, Katie, listen, please do it right. Start those meals seated. Take some 2x breaths. Teach your kids to tap on that bone. By the way, really good for test anxiety too, right? If your kids are feeling anxious before a test, they can, they can try to get into parasympathetic too. Uh, have more laughter at the table and slow things down. I'm Katie Kimball for Kids Cook Real Food and the Healthy Parenting Connector. I hope that that was a good pattern interrupt and can help shift your thinking, your language, and your understanding about your kids' relationship with food so that their relationship with food can shift into something that is much more permanent, much more positive, and much more oriented toward growth. I will see you next week for another episode of the Healthy Parenting Connector where we connect you, parents, who really want to raise healthy, independent adults with the experts who have the information you need.